Hello everybody, welcome to episode 10 of Little Big Knits. My name is Selma and I'll be your host talking and babbling on about knitting and yarn and stuff like that. So uh, welcome. Welcome if you're new, welcome if you're returning. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, and hey, check it out. It's a pretty rare occasion that Yoda makes an appearance. Um, but I'm actually podcasting um, a little earlier today. I normally podcast around 11 in the morning and I've got stuff to do today. So um, I decided that I would podcast first thing in the morning. My kids are both at sleepovers. They're actually at the same house. Um, my son is with the older brother and my daughter with the younger sister. And um, so I've got uh, until about 11 to, to, um, to do what I feel like doing and I feel like podcasting. So here I am. Hello. Thank you for joining me. Um, so yeah, so I just went on, on a little tangent. Thanks Yoda. She's now at my feet. Um, thanks to you. So anyway, I think that's why Yoda's a little bit more active because uh, she will be probably finding uh, a seat on a comfortable chair nearby very soon and um, settling down for her morning nap, shall we say. So anyway, um, yeah, so before I get into knitting, a couple of little things. Um, we have a Ravelry group. Uh, please come and join us there. There is chatter and our knit along and all kinds of other stuff going on there. You can introduce yourself. I love hearing about you and, and getting to know um, who's in my little big knits community. And, um, and there's interaction there and the show notes go there as well. And also I wanted to thank everybody for joining the group and um, for subscribing. If you actually enjoy coming back every few weeks and listening to me talk about knitting, that's like really nice. <laughs> thank you. And more than anything, I just really, really enjoy all the interactions with people. So don't be shy if, um, if you have a comment um, or you wanna uh, shout out something, go ahead. Um, so yeah, we are, um, we are at episode 10 and, um, yeah, it feels like a little bit of a, little bit of a milestone. I didn't know where I would go and I still don't, but I'm very much enjoying, uh, podcasting. So I will continue for a little while longer. So I'm sitting yet again at a slightly different angle because I wanted to show off the driftwood tree. <laughs> Um, my husband put it together and decorated it. Um, it has not been a huge hit with the children. I gotta say, my daughter very clearly said, you know, this is very nice, Papa, and my friends like it, but next year we want a real tree. But I, and I wish we had a bigger house because I'd love to have a real tree and the driftwood tree. Uh, my husband decided he wanted to make a driftwood tree because uh, he felt that that was an environmental statement. So that's what that is about, and, uh, and I, actually, I actually really like it. Um, it gives off a lot of light because unlike uh, a Christmas tree where the lights are kind of within and, and the greenery sort of mute the lights a little bit, the lights are right out there. So it, it kind of lights up our living room um, on its own. But I really do enjoy Christmas decorations. That, that and the music and some of the food traditions are really my favorite part of it. So anyway, um, yeah, so we've had a good time decorating and uh, I always have lights on the mantle and, and I don't have them lit up, but those trees light up and the angels and the little steeple right there, you can put candles in them. And so on Christmas Eve, we have everything lit up and there's lights everywhere. I just love that aspect of Christmas and the festival of lights part of it. Anyway, on with some other stuff. Um, but before I move on, I also wanted to say uh, how much fun the knit along that we're having is. We are doing a um, garment cal. It's called Garments Galore Cal, and that's the hashtag to use on Instagram if you want to post your projects there. Um, and I'm co-hosting this with my dear Kate of Hawthorne Cottage Craft podcast. Uh, we are co-hosting this, and so you can post your FOs in both groups if you like. 
Uh, we will have our own prizes, and those prizes are, are coming in. I've had um, some lovely um, offers of prizes, so I'll show those to you once they're all in. And um, uh, yeah, so you can join in if you like, if you want to uh, knit a garment. A garment is any sort of piece of clothing, not an accessory though. So like a sweater or a cardigan or skirt. Um, there have been a couple of dresses already entered. And uh, yeah, there are a lot of entries, so it's really great to see. Um, I have to say, sometimes I find myself going, oh, I need to check out that project and that pattern. And um, there are lots of really wonderful things that people are making. And great chatter in the chatter thread, too. So if you are so inclined, come and join us uh, for the knit-along. Um, and also, I wanted to do an impromptu giveaway because the lovely and truly lovely Debbie Reese of the Periscoping Sisters, if you happen to watch their podcast, she just released a new pattern and is giving away a copy. And I thought rather than waiting for people to, um, you know, write an entry or whatever this time, and I've also done YouTube uh, giveaways, I thought I would do a Ravelry Group member giveaway for this pattern. This is a beautiful sock pattern um, and she's giving away a copy to a viewer um, called the uh, Silent Snowfall. So I wanted to call it the Snow Melt, but that's another pattern. Uh, the Silent Snowfall socks. And when she posted this on Instagram, I have to say I oohed and odd because I thought, what a pretty, pretty pattern. And I have been having a hard time trying to decide which of my sock yarns I'm going to use to make this because I, I definitely, I think it's just such a pretty sock. And, um, you know, it's one thing to have socks that keep you warm, but it's nice to have lacy socks that are a little finer that perhaps you'd wear with a skirt or a pair of Mary Janes or, you know, just, just because, because you want to have pretty feet. Um, and she made hers in a yarn by Wollenwein in her tea leaves colorway, which is, you know, a pale pink speckled colorway. Um, and I actually have that colorway, but I've been thinking about other yarns and I have some lovely greens and I have some purples and I thought maybe it could be also a little bit more dramatic. Anyway, I, I am very much in love with this. Congratulations, Debbie, because it's a beautiful pattern. And so what I decided to do uh, this time was have a Ravelry Group giveaway where I just went, you can actually click and get the list of all the people and when they subscribe, so it's in order. Um, and I just did a random generator, a random number generator of the 412 members that we have in the group. And the winner of this was um, Geneviève, who is uh, Jen Duana, and that was um, number 210, and she actually subscribed to the group on August 19th of this year. I've only been podcasting since June 2017, um, so uh, the subscriptions have been all since then, obviously, because I created the group at around the same time. So anyway, congratulations, Geneviève. I will have, and I love that name, by the way. It's one of the most beautiful French names, I think. Geneviève. Um, and it's beautiful in French because in Spanish it's Genoveva, Genoveva, which, sorry, it's, well, it's okay. But, and in English people tend to say Genevieve, um, and I just think it's really beautiful in Genevieve, in French it's Genevieve. So anyway, <laughs> my little silly aside, congratulations Genevieve, I'll have uh, Debbie get in touch with you and gift that pattern to you. Um, so it is available for uh, for purchase on Ravelry if you are so inclined because it's really, really, really lovely. Just a very pretty lace pattern. I didn't print it in color, unfortunately, so it's a little bit less easy to see, but there it is. There it is, a little bit more of a close-up. Yoda's lying right beside me. Maybe if she stays there, I'll get a picture of it and insert it so you can see. Anyway, so yeah, so there you go. Um, on to knitting. I think it's about time. We're at nine minutes. Let's talk about what I'm wearing. How about that? It's an FO. It was almost an FO last time. Last time I showed you, this is the Branches and Buds sweater, which appeared in the first um, <clears throat> issue of the Making Magazine. I got it right this time. It's an issue. 
clearly I had an issue <laughs> with that word last time. Um, so uh, it's by Carrie Bostic Hogue, and it's a beautiful pattern in sport weight yarn um, that is a top-down construction with color work here. And if you can see, you afterwards embroider buds into it. So I've got buds in all kinds of different colors all around the sweater. And, um, and then the body is just stocking that. Let's see if I can, excuse me, let's see if I can stand up and show you a little bit. Whoop, whoop. So there it is, very simple. Um, I pretty much didn't modify anything, I don't think, really. Um, the only modification I do, and I think I do it with most sweaters, and it's not necessarily a modification, I just do what I feel like doing, is around the sleeve. So generally when you're doing a top-down construction, when you separate for the body and the sleeves, you put the sleeves on, you know, some sort of holder, and then you come to them afterwards. And then they tell you to uh, cast on a couple extra stitches here usually, and, um, and then you start knitting the body, and at the end um, they tell you to, to you know, uh, pick up those stitches and go in the round. I usually end up picking up more stitches because to avoid having gaps here as much as possible. And then I two together them on the first row so that it comes back in. Um, I never even look at, I just do, I just do that. I, if, if the pattern says to do it, that's great. And if it doesn't, I, I almost wouldn't even know because I just tend to be bad at reading instructions. <clears throat> Although I did read the instructions fairly well for this one and it came out beautifully. I'm very happy with it. Very happy. I find that this yoke construction is, it's a very attractive construction on people, whether it's a more closed neck or a more open neck. I had a couple of people comment, sorry, I left all my stuff down here on the floor. <laughs> um, I had a couple of people comment on the fact that my neckline seemed smaller. It did seem smaller while I was knitting it. It seems to have opened up after finishing it, but some people did have it more, but I, I think it just turned into a lovely neckline. I haven't tried it since I had it as a, as a work in progress, putting a blouse underneath it or something like that. Um, I've just worn it like this, but um, I thought it was going to end up with more ease because when I was doing the yoke, which turned out beautifully. I realize I think I just need to relax about color work a little bit and do more of it. I feel like it's just that type of thing that you just need to practice. Um, and when you do a lot of it, you just become more at ease with, with, with what's going to happen. Because I got very nervous about the length of my floats behind and I was constantly adjusting them um, because I didn't want to have puckering. And so I was, you know, trying to adjust them for, for a little bit of give. It worked out well because the, the color work worked out really beautifully. After I wet it, it just all sat in wonderfully, all the fibers nicely together. Um, but, uh, okay, maybe because it's nine o'clock in the morning, I'm gonna be rambling a little bit more because now I don't even remember what I was saying. But anyway, I was, I think I started by saying that I, I find the yoke construction really lovely and the color work on this turned out really well and um, it ended up, okay, now I remember what I was gonna say. So I was saying that when I finished the color work, I thought that the sweater was going to be a lot looser and I thought, okay, I wanted this to be kind of a Saturday afternoon type of sweater anyway. And I thought that's fine. And I thought if it turns out that it's got a lot more ease, then I thought I might do a split hem. But as I knit the torso, I realized this isn't going to be uh, as loose as I thought. So somehow I had that impression from here but then it was fine here and it just has it has a lovely fit so I have been looking at more yoke sweaters and more color work because I would like to be comfortable with it I'd like to knit one for my husband so I've been looking at some patterns for him um, and I would like to do more color work for myself as well and I'll show you in the acquisitions because I did buy a color work pattern that I have been um, I've been eyeing for a while so yeah, it's just beautiful. And this yarn, I love it. It's got lovely details where there's these pearl bumps just before you do the ribbing. I did it exactly the length. Uh, the sleeves could have been a tiny bit longer, um, but they're they're fine. Um, I did the pretty much the length of the body as well. I might have made it a tiny bit longer, but it's all worked out really well. And it's 
darn pretty. I like it. So I think that's all I have to say about it. I knit it on uh, with my Luca needles. Um, and this was the, uh, which I, as I mentioned last time, I've had some issues, um, but I'm using them right now for another project. I'm gonna continue using them. I just sometimes have issues with the joints. They don't always go on very well. And one last time, uh, it was after I podcasted and I think I wanted to cast something on and my husband and I were both trying to get the needle on and we both had a hard time. So once in a, once in a while with one needle and one cable, the joins are not always fabulous. There's a bit of an inconsistency with them. I'm still going to use them. Um, and I used them for this sweater and uh, I didn't want to change throughout because I, I do have concerns and I think other people have mentioned this about switching between metal and wooden needles because your gauge can be slightly different. Um, but yeah, no, I'll definitely continue using them and uh, I use them on this project, I'm using them on another. Another couple of little things to say about this is the yarn. This was the Isolde um, yarn, her blend number one, which was a Merino Polworth Zwartbull's um, blend. This was her fourth batch. I don't know if there was differences between the batches, but this was a truly beautiful yarn to work with. And I'm curious to see how it's going to wear. Um, I ended up, I had bought four skeins. I ended up using 3.2 skeins for this sweater. Um, each skein was 300 and something yards. Um, actually, I'm gonna tell you because I have some right here. Each skein was 345 yards. So I used 3.2, so yeah, about 1,100. Does that make that? Something like that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, um, absolutely love this. Love this yarn. And I used the Estelle Andean Heather DK for this, which was also really, really nice. And um, I, I would consider making a sweater out of that. I have a lot of it left because you really don't use a whole lot for color work. Um, so I might end up making some mitts or fingerless gloves or something with it and I'll be curious to see how it wears. So that's that. I think it's time for me to have a sip of tea because I can tell my voice is getting a little hoarse. I'm drinking wonderful tea out of this wonderful mug that my friend Kate gave me and I am drinking my standard which is this tea. It's the cardamom tea by Ahmed. Ahmed teas you can buy in the grocery store here and they have different ones. They have Earl Grey's and Darjeeling's and all kinds of things, but that cardamom tea I really, really like, and it's kind of my standard everyday tea. Thanks to Lynn Toll Baby, who is of the Two Tangle Skeins. She gave me a box of it at one point. This is the loose leaf box, but I also have bags. I use the bags at work and I use the loose leaf at home. And I just got totally addicted to it. And cardamom is definitely one of my favorite spices. Um, it's a funny spice because it appears a lot in Finnish, uh, well, in Scandinavian baking, and in other in Swedish baking as well. Um, and so for me, it's just got a real sentimental place, um, and I love the flavor. So I'm really enjoying this tea. So <clears throat> I finished this. And then I gotta say, I've got a bit of an F.O. parade about to happen because I ended up finishing and making in the last three weeks a bunch of small things. So the first thing was I was working on the slippers. I had just started them last time. These are the simple house slippers um, that I was making at, for myself because I had made a pair for my daughter and these are the ones for me. I used some hand dyed yarn that my friend Dana had bought at a market in Jan in Germany. I believe it was at a market and um, that I didn't want to let linger and I just I love these. I haven't worn them yet because I just finished them this week and I didn't want to wear them before showing them on the podcast but they fit they're the funniest looking things but they actually they fit really well um, and they're a piece of cake to make uh, like really it probably takes about an hour and a half to make one and they're just I don't know, I, I don't ever count how much time it makes t takes to make things, but really easy. Probably uses, this was um, fingering weight yarn that I, uh, that I double stranded because these are supposed to be worsted weight. Um, and I used a four millimeter needle. And you really just go back and forth here and then you start going in the round and then there's a, a fancy formula for the toes and then you sew up the back. 
It's a free pattern on Ravelry, so if you're in the mood for something super simple, um, using up yarn, you could use one yarn for here and another yarn for there. It's a great way um, to use up yarns that are perhaps, you know, leftovers. Um, and also, I think yarns that you want to look at all the time because I'm going to be wearing these all the time. So I'm going to look at this yarn every day. So, and it'll remind me of my friend Dana. So I finished these. There's the second one. Um, super fun. And it's the kind of thing you could make in cotton if you live in a warmer climate or want them for the summertime. You can make them in wool. You can make them in acrylic. Um, you can make them absolutely and you can make 10 pairs and have them at the at the entrance so that when visitors come they can put them on um, yeah you could make them Franken style you know and just use little bits and bobs of, of yarns um, so so that's one fo I got three more three more fo's um, I finished the socks that I had been knitting I started them at the beginning of September um, and as I had mentioned before, and I forgot the sock blockers upstairs, um, as I had mentioned before, uh, my sock mojo has not been fabulous this year, have not been so into making socks. Um, and I have a lot of socks uh, right now. I've got a nice, nice basket full of socks. I don't feel like I need socks, but they are a great present. Um, and I finished the pair. I'm sorry I didn't get the blockers because, and I'm just, I'd rather not split and splice and do all that stuff, so I'm going to try and avoid that. Um, so this, I made these socks out of Felici yarn, and I'm going to be giving them to my friend Judy. I made Judy a pair of socks last year for Christmas, and she is about as knit worthy as it gets because she raved about those socks she absolutely loved them she said she wears them all the time and i thought well they're going to wear out really quickly so i should make her a second pair since she enjoyed them so much and she's one of these people who's always cold um so i thought last year i'm going to make her socks because i bet she'll make a difference and they did so um this is the felici yarn in the hmm darn it what was the colorway again had something to do with doctor who Time Traveler colorway um, and uh, this is the uh, slip and swirl sock pattern by Chris Loves Wool that uh, the dear Amy give to me thank you Amy once again such an easy but really subtle and effective um, slip stitch pattern I had a funny a little bit of I switched it over because I didn't want you to see my mistake <laughs> maybe I should just show you my mistake. I, I don't, I somehow ended up with one extra stitch. So whenever I got to the side, I had to fidget and I could have just gotten rid of the stitch, but I don't know. It never occurred to me to do that. So anyway, I just really enjoyed that. I didn't follow the pattern except for the stitch count because I always end up doing a gusset with this um, basic gusset heel by Wendy D. Johnson. She has a couple of books on toe up socks and uh, I just, I've memorized this. I'd like to explore other heels, but so far I've just memorized this and it's the easiest thing. And so I always end up doing that and it fits me really nicely. So I figure it must fit others. Um, but yeah, uh, I knit these on 2.25 chow goo needles, which I always use. They're my favorite sock needles and, um, they're really great. I love this colorway. It's absolutely beautiful. It's, it's a funny combination of colors. Um, and yet it works because we were having a conversation one day knitting at work. I was like, this color here, not the most attractive color in my opinion, but I'm sure somebody, and it'll probably look great on somebody, really not my color. Um, but when you put all the colors together, they just look really lovely. And I'm really into this, uh, cream and yellow combination for some reason. I would really like to make myself a color work sweater out of yellow with cream color work up here. So we'll see if that ends up happening. But um, anyway, these are the socks. So these will be a Christmas present for my friend Judy. The other thing that I made, I'm not so happy with, is a hat for my son. You've never heard me talk about knitting for my son because my son is not so keen on having knitted items. He is very specific. But what he likes, he's very much into black these days. 
very much into wearing certain types of clothes. His hair is very important to him. He's 14. And so I don't know how it came out in conversation, but somehow he expressed interest in a hat. And I thought, I better make him a hat. So I thought, and it's gotta be something kind of black. I don't have a lot of black yarn. Um, and the black yarn that I do have is the sweater quantity. And so I'm afraid to take uh, yarn from it at this point um, because I haven't used it for a sweater yet. So I had some Malabrigo Chunky that I had gotten at the factory when we went to uh, Uruguay three years ago. Um, I couldn't tell you, maybe it's black pearl. I don't actually know what colorway this is um, because it was from the, the seconds bin. And the reason I realized when I started knitting, well, when I started winding it, the reason it was in the seconds bin was that there had been a bit of felting. So some of the strands had felted, so they had clearly had a temperature issue in the water. And even though I think this is supposed to be super wash, it had felted. Um, so I made him this very basic hat. I think I knitted on five millimeter needles, uh, cast on 80 stitches, did two by two ribbing for as long as I thought. And then I knit, and then when I realized I was gonna start running out of yarn, <laughs> I did um, decreases. And I just kind of, I think I did them every eight stitches uh, and then every second row, you know, like a, I did like, what did I do? I think I did eight, knit two together, eight knit two together, and then seven knit two together, seven knit two together, and so forth every second row until you had practically no stitches left. But the reason this is not great for my son is it's not really slouchy enough. It's a stiff, it ended up being a stiff uh, with five millimeters on a chunky yarn, it ended up being a little on the stiff side. So it has a tendency to just want to like do that. Now, I would put it down and it would be fine. Black is just not my color. Um, but I don't think this is for him. And so I decided that I actually went out and got him some nice yarn that will just be more easily slouchy, um, not bad grammar, but whatever. Um, and I think that, you know, this will be nicer for a woman who knows to pull it down. Um, and, uh, you know, it ends up with a nice shape. So I'm thinking about giving it to a friend of mine and, uh, and I'm going to knit him something else. Uh, I'll show it to you now. I was going to show it to you in the acquisition section, but I just, I went to our local yarn store the other day and I, um, ended up seeing the uh, Sadness Garn uh, Alpaca um, in their sales section in black. So this is a sport weight, uh, very drapey alpaca yarn. So I'm going to make him a hat with this and I think that that'll work really well and it'll be warm. Um, it'll have the, the slouch that he wanted because he was like, well, mom, I think the hat's just not long enough. And I was like, no, I think it's that it's, <laughs> it's just, unless you fiddle with it and do that, it's not going to slouch. Um, so I'm going to make him a hat out of this over the holidays. While they're in uh, Uruguay, I will be um, making him a hat and then he'll have it when he gets back. We're having really mild weather so far. Um, it is supposed to get really cold again, but I I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't have snow before Christmas. So they might be coming back to snow, but we'll have to see. But anyway, I thought I'll just make this for him over Christmas. Or when, or maybe I'll make it at work over the next week or something like that. So this is the second defo. That was like super fast, kind of like the slippers. It was just one of those things that um, you just whipped up almost. The last fo I have. Did I even talk about this last time? I don't know if I did but I wanted to make a hat for my mom. And um, I had wanted some nice, luxurious, cream-colored yarn. And, and then I remembered that I had made myself a hat um, and another one for my friend out of some beautiful alpaca by Ilamani. And I thought, oh, I wonder if I have any of that left. And then it turned out that I had leftovers enough from both skeins that I had used for my hat and my friend's hat. There was enough to make a hat for my mom. My mother had always really liked my Ricca hat. I made myself this Ricca hat out of um, 
I think it's Brooks Farm alpaca that I bought at uh, Rhinebeck my first year that I was there. Um, and every time I wear it, she comments on it. Um, I think she likes the shape, the color is beautiful. It's like a royal purple. Um, and so I thought, well, maybe I'll make her a Rika hat. And I, I love this hat, although I knit it as the pattern said, which was 3.5 millimeter and 4.5 millimeter for here, I believe. And I thought I'd like to do something a little bit more snug because I find it a little on the floppy side. But I still love the hat. It's alpaca. It's very warm. Um, my daughter and I compete for it. She'll, she'll often want to wear it. Um, uh, last year, I pretty much lost the hat, but right now she hasn't noticed it again. So I, I've been able to wear it. But um, so I thought I'm going to make myself, or my mother rather, a Rika hat. So I took out the Ilimani um, and made her a Rika hat, which is just, it's, you know, it's a really simple hat. It's garter stitch. But this time what I did, Illimani is kind of a worsted, I would say light worsted weight, but I used three millimeter needles instead of 3.5 and I used four millimeters here. So it's a bit of a tighter gauge and it's a beautiful yarn. It's a beautiful yarn. So I actually went and bought more because now I want a hat. I finished this for my mom and when I put it on, I was like, I want one because this one, um, I have to measure. I was going to do that before I podcasted and then I forgot. But there is definitely a difference in length of a good inch, no more. And sometimes I find this almost too slouchy. And I thought my mom's not going to want something very slouchy. So I thought I'm going to make a less slouchy version and see what happens. And I just love this. And as I said, I think my mom's going to want to wear it like that. Kind of more of a sort of a bit of a 1920s style. Um, I absolutely love this. You know, this is a pattern that is used often with variegated yarns and such, but it's really beautiful with a solid color as well. It just becomes a simple yet striking item. So this is going to be for my mom, but I want it. So. I went out and bought some more. Um, this is the Illimani Royale number one, which is made out of, um, it's from, it's Royal Alpaca from Bolivia. And um, it is absolutely beautiful. Really, really beautiful. I made myself a hat out of it year, a few years ago. And this is also the hat that I made for my friend. This is the Moon Hat by Kim Hargreaves. I can't remember which book of hers it's from. Um, if I find out before I, I finish editing all that, I'll let you know. Um, I made this out of the Illimani um, and with a skein of silk mohair. So you can see that it's got a halo. But this is another one that has ended up a little too big. I still wear it. I was wearing it yesterday, in fact. But I cannot wear this on a windy day because it will blow off my head. Because it's just... <laughs> So as long as I, you know, I place it nicely and there's no wind, we're all good. Uh, but it, it will, like if I shake around, it will just flop around. So it, I realized that with this type of a yarn, uh, with alpaca, a tighter gauge is probably a good idea if you want a hat that's really gonna stick. This is, you know, like this is fine and um, I enjoy it um, and it keeps me warm. But as I said, on a windy day, I need something that's gonna stick. Uh, to my head a little bit more. So I, I think I wanted like the perfect cream hat and I feel like this is it. So I'm going to make one for myself as well. And my mother will get this one. And I decided to do white because I think it'll go nicely with, uh, with her coat and what she has and I think it'll look lovely on her. Um, and uh, you know, she might end up with a second one too at some point, we'll see. So that's it for FOs. It feels like I've knit a lot, hasn't it, doesn't it? But I think they were all small items <clears throat> and uh, they were things that were made fairly quickly. So, and once I got into the second sock, I really just motored along. Um, and I really felt like finishing things this week. So that's what I focused on. 
And as a result, I don't really have a proper whip in progress because um, in the last couple of days, I started swatching for the Janus or Janus sweater that I showed you guys last time um, with the, uh, what's it called? Ethical blend yarn that I had. I showed this sweater to you. Um, and so I started swatching for it. Right now everything's being housed in my wonderful Buku bucket bag. Um, <clears throat> and I started swatching with the Chow Goos. By the way, I absolutely love the Chow Goo interchangeables. Hands down, they're fabulous. I have a feeling that you just can't go wrong with the Chow Goos or the um, Hi Hias. That's, that's the impression I'm getting. Um, I used them for a couple of the projects can't even remember now and I just I was like yeah these are fabulous in fact when I finished the project I was like okay where do these go because are these the interchangeables or are they the fixed because it's just such a smooth join you just never know they become exactly like the fixed circular so really really like my chow goose so anyway so I've swatched that's all I've done this is a four millimeter needle it's a DK yarn and, and I'm quite liking it um, but I do want to try it on the 4.5 just to see because because the sweater is a very cabled sweater it's going to have a tighter gauge and I don't want it to be too dense so um, I might see what this feels like with the 4.5 and um, and actually try it with the cables and see what happens we'll see so that's all I did on that and then <clears throat> yesterday I'm sorry, I seem to have <clears throat> gotten a little frog in my throat again. Espace Tricot published a new pattern, and their patterns are always free, by the way, and they just have a really fabulous, you know, sleek line, uh, simple lines kind of, of aesthetic. And um, they came out with this cowl recently called Getting Warmer. And it's a cowl that you can, it's really got this sort of funnel shape to it. You can wear it sort of over your shoulders, sideways. If you happen to watch Espace Tricot, uh, one of them was wearing it uh, the last episode, I think, and it just looked fabulous. And I thought, I really want to make that. They used for this pattern Wolf Folk, Wolf Folk Far, Wolf Folk Luft, which is, um, and they use six millimeter needles. Um, so it's a sort of a bulky, bulky pattern. I didn't want to go out and buy yarn, so I had some um, leftovers from a sweater I made. I made a sweater uh, with these two yarns, double-stranded, um, the Simple turno Turnover, the Simple Turtleneck by um, Heidi and Anna Pickles, um, which is a free pattern. Is it a free pattern? Not sure. Anyway, it's a top-down turtleneck, um, and I made this out of it. And I've got lots of it left because it was also knit on six millimeter needles and so I didn't use that much of it and I ended up with way more yarn left over. Um, and what is this? This is the Giselle yarn, I think, by Estelle. Down bar, I'll let you know. And, uh, and this is the um, Sadness Garn Alpaca <clears throat> in colorway 5244. And so I decided, hey, why don't I use some of this for that cowl? Because it'll look good with my coats and, you know, and if I, and I could I even end up being a gift for somebody. So I cast it on yesterday and I've knit the first two rows. So there isn't a whole lot to see. So not much in Whipsville this week, I'm afraid. Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing what this is like. And I could see myself knitting more of these. It's kind of like the Ricka hat. I could even have combinations. <gasps> anyway, <laughs> all the ideas. Um, so that's being knit on six millimeter needles and these are the, uh, the look goods, by the way. These ones went on beautifully and this particular size has such a gorgeous gray to it. Yeah, and so when they're on, they're great. It's just sometimes the joins are a little funny. This is being housed in a bag that my friend Dana made for me. I thought this will be the right size for it uh, when it gets a little bit bigger. So it's there with the Royal Peacocks. 
And so that's it for the, not a whole lot in the whip section. Um, I'll just throw everything over there on the floor. Um, I do have some acquisitions, so I'll continue on with some of those and then maybe a little bit of chitter chatter at the end and then that'll be it for today. Speaking of wool folk, because that's what they used in the getting colder cowl pattern, my dear friend Aiden, who is the knitting monk, and he also has a podcast called the Make Pilgrimage, um, the Maker's Pilgrimage, and um, which I really enjoy, and I've really enjoyed getting to know Aiden. And he asked me if I wanted to have this, which is like a total Selma color, total Selma color. Oh, I, I I'm thinking hat. Um, although there's a lot of it, but I was thinking of double stranding it, um, with some mohair, but we'll see, we'll see what is going to, going to be. I think in total it ends, it's the, he wasn't sure what it was because it didn't have the tags. Um, but I think it's the wool folk tund, which is, or tind, T-Y-N-D, which is their fingering base. Um, and this beautiful blend, I believe it's a blend of merino and... Um, and Ovix, Ovix Merinos, that's what it is, and it comes from Patagonia, so it's from, uh, from Argentina, so anyway, it's absolutely stunning and soft and delicate and a beautiful color, so thank you very much, Aiden, um, and it came with chocolate, which is lovely. Um, yeah, so I, this is so beautiful and I can't wait. I keep thinking about what I want to make with it, but I know that the right project will come, but I just, this, this is, I think this is actually one of my, this is probably my favorite color. Um, stormy sky gray, you know, when the storm is just going to come, I look at the sky and I just think that is the most beautiful thing. And that's kind of what this color is. Um, in terms of yarn, as I mentioned, I bought some drops. I bought some more Illimani. And then I bought some Cascade. I bought four skeins of Cascade because I want to make the Chuck sweater by Andy Satterland. Um, I can't even remember who made it first, but I thought, oh, that looks okay. That looks nice. And then I saw somebody else, and oh, I like that. And then I saw somebody else make it. And then Kristen of Volenvine um, in her podcast this week had cast it on I thought you know I really want a small cropped sweater to go with skirts for work and so I went to our local store the other day this is coming across as quite berry like it's a little bit less berry like maybe it'll come across as less berry like but for me it's looking very berry like um, it's a little bit more um, a bit more burgundy ish in real life this is number it's in their heathered cascade heathered uh, the 220 Heathered, and this is colorway 4008. And so I will probably be making the chuck. If not, uh, Andy Satterlin has another one called Tessellate, I think, and I quite like that one as well. So um, I'll be making one of her cropped sweaters out of this. And I only bought four skeins, so it has to be cropped. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I might be casting that on quite soon because a red sweater at this time of the year makes sense, doesn't it? Um, and um, yeah, I, we'll see. It, I'm sort of in competition between Andy Sanderlin's pattern and the Janus um, by Irina Anikeva that I really want to make from the magazine. So we'll see. Um, I really want to make the, the Janus sweater, but I'm going to be honest, there's a slight bit of intimidation because of all the cables. Not that I find them difficult, but I do find them a little tedious. Um, but I'm hoping that my feelings will change when I start knitting it and it'll become a joy to knit. But I am kind of, like I want the sweater, I'm just not 100% sure I want to deal with all those cables. So I'm finding myself procrastinating with that sweater and fantasizing about other ones. But I'm determined to give it a go. And if it turns out that I start knitting it and it's just like, I just can't stand doing this, then I'll, I'll knit another pattern with it. But I'm really looking forward to at least trying it. And I also want to make Andy, the Andy Sadlin sweater. So I got some of that. 
I also received a beautiful parcel from a viewer. Um, thank you. Who um, sent me because I was, as she said, waxing poetic about the Zolder yarn. She sent me two steams of it. Dale, thank you so much. That was really, really sweet and very generous. I now have 2.7, 2.8 skeins of this. Um, again. And so I've asked my friend who's going to EYF in March that if the Isolde booth happens to have any more of this to buy me a skein of it, so then I would have almost four skeins again and could maybe make a sweater for myself or for my husband. Something with color work for sure. But um, that was a real surprise and thank you so much. It's like, what a beautiful gift. Um, I'm gonna enjoy working with it because, you know, when I was knitting this sweater, actually, I never got into Sleeve Island. I loved the yarn so much, as simple as it is, that I just enjoyed knitting it. It was only towards the end of the second sleeve that I was like, okay, okay, let's let's get on with this now. I'm ready for something else. But it was just such a joy to knit with. So um, I'm, I'm just thrilled to have more of it. Thank you so much, Dale. Dale didn't only send this. She also sent something that she said, if I wanted, I could give it as a prize. This is gonna be tough because when I opened the package, my daughter picked it out of my hands right away. It's fascinating yarn. It's this yarn here, which is called Mondim. And it's actually a Portuguese yarn. Dale has a shop, which is an online presence called Farm to Cables. And, um, which I had already checked out, so I didn't know that you had this shop. Um, there is her logo. Uh, it's a Canadian-based shop, and she's got an interesting selection of yarns. Um, and she has this yarn, and this is very interesting yarn. Um, and I think I'm going to give it for a giveaway, even though I'm really tempted to keep it, um, because I'm I'm collecting something for a, an upcoming giveaway for you guys. And I thought, well, this is lovely. This is sock yarn, but it is 100% Portuguese wool, but it's meant to be made for socks. Um, so there are more and more people who are wanting to move away from any unnatural fibers. Um, and so this is a really interesting one and, it, and it's got the feel of a sock yarn. It feels extremely sturdy. It feels, you can actually kind of feel the oils in it still. And, you know, as, despite its beautiful, delicate coloring, this is, um, this feels like a workhorse yarn. So, um, it's very interesting. Thank you, Dale. And I'm going to keep this for a giveaway, uh, for one of you. It's very interesting. So, of course, Isla saw the pink and the green and she gravitated towards it. But it's also got this great sort of chocolate brown, almost black, going through it. So, it's beautiful. So, thank you again, Dale. That was really, really lovely. Um, Yasmin, another viewer, uh, gifted me so very kindly as well. Thank you, guys. This is totally unnecessary, by the way. Um, but... She gifted me a sweater pattern, which I had already been looking at, um, the Carry Town by Annie Lupton. And this is a DK weight sweater. Uh, if you watch, I think uh, Tiny Paper Foxes made this recently. Um, and uh, Katie of Inside 23 has actually been making it as well. And I think just recently finished it. Um, it's a wonderful drop shoulder construction, kind of a relaxed sweater. Um, so I don't have any DK weight yarn that would work with this right now, but I've been sort of thinking, hmm, what am I going to get for this? Because it's really, really a lovely sweater. And the sweaters that I've seen on Ravelry on Instagram have, have been all been very lovely. So yeah. So thank you very much, Yasmin. I mentioned earlier that I also had to get myself a color work sweater pattern. So I got the sea change by Jennifer Steingas from Knit Love Wool and have been fantasizing about what colors I will use for this. I saw one on Ravelry where she had olive green here 
and white and then gray up there, which I really, really liked. Um, so we'll see what ends up coming about, but that's another one that I purchased. And then another sock pattern that came into my life that I bought uh, a while ago, but then had trouble printing it, um, was the Fergus Socks by Anne Freiberg, uh, who is Yarnsty online. And uh, she designs fabulous socks. So this is, um, and people who've made it have loved it. So I'm looking forward to making this as well. Um, Lee, who is Luli, and who is the ba bag maker extraordinaire behind uh, the Luli bags, um, also um, recently designed and gifted me uh, a a copy as well as for you guys but I've been having a hard time printing it I don't know why so I hope I'll be able to show it but she made um, three different patterns using owl an owl motif that's color work and they're super beautiful so I hope to be able to show that for you to you next time and then um, and then that is going to be a giveaway probably for the garment cow so yeah so I think that wraps things up um, if you're not in for the tiny bit of chatter, uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining me. Otherwise, yeah, I'll just, uh, let me see what has been going on. We're in the month of December and um, it was my daughter's birthday at the end of November and there was uh, the family and friends celebration. There was her friends celebration and it went all really well. Um, and so, only after Isla's birthday can we ever start thinking about Christmas. So uh, the day after she had her friend's birthday on December 2nd, then uh, the tree got made and the Christmas decorations came out. So we've actually still got balloons on the ceiling and then um, Christmas decorations around. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. So now that we're into December, uh, there's some fun stuff happening. Um, although I have to say, because my husband and my two children are going away, I really haven't thought much about um, about Christmas in the same way that I normally do because normally I'm thinking about the food, I'm thinking about presents, I'm online buying things, I'm going out in the evenings and um, we are going to be celebrating uh, when they return from Uruguay. Uh, I think they come back on the 10th or the 11th so that following Saturday we'll be um, having a big Christmas gathering. Um, so it's been kind of a bit of a, a more relaxed December. We did have dinner with friends last night. Tonight I'm going to a nitty Christmas at my friend Holly's house. Lynn and Sue, the two Tangle Skeins will be there as well as some other knitting friends. And um, tomorrow my daughter has her piano recital. Um, and we'll be going out for dinner after as we always do when we have a couple of surrogate aunties who come. I'm an only child and um, my husband comes from a family of four, but of course they're all in Uruguay because he was the only one to leave. So um, we have some dear friends who have become aunties and, and um, treat our kids as if they really are their, their niece and nephew. So they'll be coming with us as well as my mom and then we'll be going out for dinner afterwards. Um, next weekend, we have um, a tradition in my house where we make spoon cookies. Um, spoon cookies are a typical, actually I don't know how typical they are. They're a cookie from Finland. In Finnish they're called Lusika Leipia and Lusika means spoon in Finnish. And I used to get them at the bakery in the small town Lapua where my grandmother lived and I visited every year. I spent my summers in Lapua. And the bakery had these cookies and every once in a while we'd get them and they were just the most amazing things. And then one day I realized, why don't I start making spoon cookies? They're not the easiest cookie to make. They're a little bit labor intensive. They are made with browned butter, and they're, but they're a shortbread. And then you shape them with spoons and bake them that way and then you put them together with strawberry jam. And they're just a very interesting flavor because the browned butter makes you, you think there's nuts in there, but there aren't any nuts but they have a bit of a, a nutty flavor to them and they're fabulous. And when I started making them, everybody raved. In fact, there was an article in Gourmet Magazine, the now defunct Gourmet Magazine years ago that said, the best cookie in the world and it was all about the spoon cookie. And you can actually find the recipe for spoon cookies on epicurious.com if you happen to be interested in giving it a try. 
So my friends were all raving about these cookies, but they are a little on the labor intensive side, not hugely, but enough that I was like, I just can't make these. So we started having a spoon cookie day. And every year that is something that happens. Uh, my friends come over, they bring a pound of butter and a tin and I start making the dough before they arrive and we make several batches and everybody's making spoon, the, shaping them and having something to drink and, um, and we're just chatting and then everybody leaves with um, some spoon cookies and um, we get spoon cookies and even though nobody's gonna be around this year my son was insisting that uh, spoon cookie is happening so it's happening we usually also make a gingerbread house from scratch I don't think that will happen this year I don't think so um, just because it is also another big thing the whole family gets involved and my mom comes over and we make the dough and we let it sit and then we make the you know the pieces and all that stuff but I'm not sure this might be a, a non gingerbread house year we'll see we haven't decided but next Saturday is spoon cookie day and then that Sunday is um, the Christmas pageant at the church and my daughter's got a role in it and the teenagers always do something as well so I think my son will be in it as well and um, and then we'll be making gingerbread cookies and um, which I'll also send off to Uruguay they'll be going off with some some spoon cookies and some gingerbread cookies which hopefully will will survive the trip they probably will and um, and then they'll be off and I'll be hanging out with my mom we'll have a quiet Christmas um, and uh, and just spending it together and hanging out with friends may go to Montreal one day I may go see my father in Quebec City as well um, and uh, and even though it'll be kind of a weird Christmas in the sense that my family won't be here it'll also be lovely quiet time for me um, you know being a parent you don't often get a house to yourself so that's gonna be pretty cool and I'm looking forward to that part of it even though I'm gonna miss them like crazy um, and uh, and then when they come back we'll celebrate so we'll see if sometime in the next couple of weeks I will be able to podcast because I'll be on my own so you might see me sooner rather than later if you are a if you do celebrate Christmas and I don't have a chance to podcast before then I wish you the best of holidays um, and hope that you will enjoy them in whatever way you can or need to it's a funny time of the year. Some people uh, struggle through this time of the year and so I hope that you can find, if, it, if you are one of those people who does, that you find the time to enjoy yourself, take care of yourself and the people around you and, um, and then it'll be New Year and we'll be into 2018. So I do hope to see you before 2018. Um, enjoy the month of December. And we'll see you again, probably a little bit later in the month. Take care, everybody. I'm going to stop because I'm starting to ramble like crazy. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.